welcome to the e-commerce nurse podcast our 25th episode i'm karina mcleod ex-amazonian and ceo and founder of e-commerce nurse and vendor society today we're going to be talking about the risks of selling on amazon and how to protect your business we have a special guest chris mccabe a former amazonian who helps sellers communicate with amazon to protect and save their businesses after working for amazon for many years evaluating seller account performance and enforcing Amazon's policies, Chris launched e-commerce Chris. He teaches sellers how to think like Amazon and helps them protect their accounts, appeal listing restrictions and suspensions, report abuse and escalate seller issues. So hi, Chris, a big thank you for taking the time to come on our show today. I'm super excited to talk to you about the risks of selling on Amazon. And I love that part in your bio about learning how to think the at like Amazon and even talk like Amazon, which is often the biggest challenge. Yeah, and always great to talk to another former Amazonian. There's so many of us out there now. So um, thanks for having me. And I think it's essential to think that way and, and occupy the same mental space as the people, at least the people who read reinstatement appeals, whether it's a, an ASIN reinstatement, your listing's been taken down or your whole account. Um, because I see the results when people don't think that way and they, they do this themselves. And I don't mind when people try to do it themselves without hiring an expert right out of the gate, mm -hmm. as long as they are thinking the way somebody in seller performance would think, or mm -hmm. like the item quality investigations teams or something that involves a restriction or, or punishment or discipline anything where they'd be taking things away from you or li limiting your ability to sell. Um, when you think like you, you know, if you're, <laughs> you lack, you're too subjective, you're thinking like yourself, which normally that's what we do all day long. And you're not thinking like somebody else, which in this case is living in their skin, thinking their thoughts, how would they view your appeal? Um, you're killing your odds of a successful reinstatement. That's the real problem and you're adding to the, the delay in getting reinstated. Sometimes you might be burying your odds of even being reinstated at all, but you're also just extending that time period and adding to your frustration. And the more you get frustrated, mm -hmm. uh, the more you wanna lash out at Amazon usually, and lashing out at Amazon isn't very productive. <laughs> um, but it also, I think, hurts your ability to compose and revise your appeal from the first one that you did, which you thought was pretty good and they didn't accept, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I just see people that keep kind of going down and down and down those stairs to the point where they're in the, the deep dark basement and they have to climb their way back out. Um, and people like us are out there to assist, but we can't always rescue everyone who has gone down too far too fast and created too much of a mess. That's the real issue. Completely. and it's and the the ch challenge here is that there's an um, there's an emotional element here right as well mm -hmm. it's not just uh sort of uh very subjective although it really needs to be it is there's emotion there's there's uh people's businesses on the line so it'd be good to start off you know with those because I, I imagine there's some listeners on here that might be in one of those situations right now mm -hmm. some businesses that are looking to go on to seller and maybe you've heard some stories. And so it would be good to start and talk about what those common, common risks are um, uh, when a seller is basically uh, launching um, their product and selling on Amazon. Right. And several years ago, when I started, the stories maybe weren't as public, as common, as easy to find, but now they are. So I'm hoping that as people get started selling on Amazon, if they're new, they won't make a ton of assumptions. They'll do some research, they'll prepare, and they'll also learn by consuming some of these, you know, horror stories. I mean, some of the horror stories, just to preface this risks of selling conversation, some of the horror stories are people who jump started their business because they thought it was lucrative. It was a good opportunity to add in a second funnel of income. They weren't prepared they didn't really research Amazon, they jumped in too soon, or they didn't have the business aptitude to manage a business and manage their operations. So just to preface any other comments about Amazon itself with that, um, because there are risks mm -hmm. and 
you can't play the card with Amazon of I'm brand new and I didn't really know, or mm -hmm. we started so quickly we didn't have time to read the policy pages. Um, as blunt as I can be about this, they don't care. Mm -hmm. They really don't care how new you are. They don't want you learning on the fly. So mm -hmm. the number one initial risk, especially for newbies or beginners is don't assume you'll get a pass on operational mistakes, on policy mistakes, even on how to write an appeal type mistakes, just because you're new um, and, and because you think it's a good idea to write in the first sentence of a plan of action, we're new, we've only been selling for three months. I can't say this often enough. That's actually a huge detriment. You think it's helping you to say that. It's, it's having the opposite effect. What you're telling somebody in seller performance, whether it's fairly or not, we can debate, what you're telling them is, I wasn't ready for this. I might not be ready for it now. I might not be ready for it three months from now. You're kind of standing up and waving that you're a novice yeah. and that you're going to create headaches and problems for them. You're possibly going to ruin buyer experiences because you're new or naive or you're unschooled. So again, all walks of life, this is easy to understand. If you started a new job tomorrow, there would be some initial days or weeks of learning some things on the job, right? You can't learn everything before day one of a job. That's not what this is. <laughs> what does Amazon expect? They do expect you to know everything on day one mm -hmm. of the job. Um, and they don't care if their policy pages are vague. If you interpret a policy the wrong way and you go do your own thing and you get suspended, that's still your fault to them, not the fact that they had badly written pages. So front-loading the knowledge, mm -hmm. front-loading and front-loading expertise. I mean, the good news is, um, not to give you an even more long-winded answer, but the good news is more people are approaching us mm -hmm. before they start to sell or early in the process saying, we hear about these mistakes, we hear about these nightmares, we're trying to avoid them. Three, four years ago, I didn't have nearly the same numbers of people. So, I mean, it is trending in the right direction. But that's great though, in a way. I mean, not that businesses are being suspended or or yeah. accounts being deactivated and listings being deactivated, but the fact that businesses are really realizing that they need to be proactive. It's not about winging it and just sort of, oh, I'll see how it goes if I get suspended and not taking it seriously. You know, we've right. had this where we've had those conversations when sellers come on board. And you can see the performance metrics. They're not adhering to the rules and you let mm. them know. And they're just like, oh, no, no, it will never happen. We're all right. And businesses, are just some people, businesses aren't taking it so seriously. Yeah. Or they just make kind of basic beginner mistakes. I can think of an example where somebody had a pricing error and instead of, you know, charging a hundred pounds for something, they were charging a pound or they, you know, 10 pounds, they missed, they missed a zero. So they canceled the whole you know, a bunch of orders because mm -hmm. they were like, well, we're not going to lose 90 quid on all of these orders um, on, on, on each of these, for each of these buyers. They didn't understand they're guaranteeing a suspension of the account because their cancellation rate spiked instead of just understanding, well, it's a mistake, but it's, and it's some red ink on our side, but it's a mm -hmm. mistake we just have to learn from and we have to take the hit and we have to sell all these items at 10 pounds instead of a hundred because that's the cost of doing business when you're new and you make mistakes. They weren't thinking that way at all. They thought yeah. they could just open a ticket with seller support or email my former teams and seller performance and say, look, you know, beginner bad, we made a mistake, but we couldn't, you know, assume this, this giant financial, no way, no way. That's the exact wrong way to think. Um, and, and then there are other people who are like, we didn't even get off the ground. We sold for two weeks Mm -hmm. And they suspended us. Like, why are they, you know, we're going to make them money too, not just ourselves. Why are they, again, they're thinking of it backwards, flip it yeah. around. Well, from Amazon's perspective, you don't have any value to them yet. Mm -hmm. They're operating out of self-interest. They're not operating out of a sense of partnership with you where there's a fairness and an inequality on both sides. Yep. If you're suspended, I mean, there's thousands of accounts at any given yep. moment that are suspended for identity verification failure, um, could be VAT, you know, exams that, that take forever to complete. Those accounts, you know, why do they never respond to those appeals? Why do they ignore all those people? Because you don't have any value to them yet. Mm -hmm. They're not spending a lot of free time looking up your website, looking at your Shopify, trying to figure out what you're doing on eBay, what you're doing on Walmart and saying, well, they'll sell 10 times more 
Mm -hmm. than they sell on those channels on Amazon. So we're going to quickly push them through and get them that, uh, you know, 10 million of gross revenue this year that we're projecting. None of that happens. Mm -hmm. You're an unproven entity at that point. Yeah. And I guess that's the, that's the frustrating part, isn't it? When, uh, and businesses do say, well, does Amazon not realize it seems crazy the amount of revenue that we can drive, et cetera, et cetera, they're missing out. But yeah. Amazon's generating a huge amount of revenue with or without you. So it doesn't mm -hmm. put you at the top of um, the top of the list. So, you yeah. know, and, and one part which I find um, in conversations, we've had conversations previous to this podcast in uh, mm -hmm. about sort of sellers being having their accounts suspending the issues that they have. And you mentioned something really interesting and it's always sort of installed in my mind and that I shared with my team is that sellers should be including the costs involved in all of this, the pre getting to understand Amazon, probably the issues that could arise later on down the line and building that into their bottom, bottom line. And I think that is such a valid point and something that I would love for you to elaborate more on, because I think those that are listening, I think this is something that is vital when you've got your seller business on Amazon. Yeah, and it's something I've believed for a while, more expressed in private conversations with people who were suspended who, you know, mm -hmm. paid us for a consult or something. But over time, I've realized it makes sense to be more vocal about it because we do hear a lot, you know, well, we spent a lot of money on manufacturing the product. We spent a lot of money on, ma on marketing the product. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of money on ads. We spent a lot of money on, they're thinking just about revenue generation. And a lot of those people mentally had never considered or had mentally eliminated what if something goes wrong mm -hmm. right before we sell right after we start selling so there's all these stories out there running par you know listing suspensions running parallel to the idea that in the initial stages of an amazon business you're only focusing on growth mm -hmm. and on managing your day-to-day -day operations of course growth is important of course operational efficiency is crucial i'm not saying they're not but what we do for a living in terms of something goes wrong, you have to troubleshoot a suspension that should be baked into any cost of any new business or the cost of growing an Amazon business um, right from the beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. you should expect, I think there's enough knowledge out there now, whether you're consuming the right sources or the wrong sources, there's enough info out there that's public now for you to know if I start an Amazon business tomorrow, um, I could be suspended the day after or the week after. You should go in with that mindset. It's almost like, uh, I, I don't know what the best business parallel is, but for something like, uh, you know, the, the secret service agents protecting the president of the United States, what's their job? It's trying to prevent something, mm -hmm. but it's being ready. It's being ready for, ready for a wide variety of problems, threats, outcomes, whatever. And it's kind of like that with Amazon, you could start selling a product where you don't think competition is going to be a huge mm -hmm. problem, but then somebody could spring up and two, three months in, start selling what you're selling, start complaining that you're not selling what you're selling, mm -hmm. buying from you and saying the product is shoddy or it's not as advertised or it's unsafe. That's, that's It's not just Amazon that you're worried about. You always have to worry about runaway bots and Amazon mistakes, technical glitches. I mean, I think people understand that Amazon's unpredictable and Amazon is inefficient, but what about competitors? We're talking to people that haven't even thought, I mean, they look at their competition in terms of price yeah. and in terms of selection, they're treating it like a standard business problem. Like you're putting your product on shelves in a store next to other products. Okay. But on Amazon, there's lots of abuse and you don't necessarily have a team that's responsive to you when you're being attacked. Like, have they thought about that before launching, not even just starting a new business, like opening an account, but launching a new brand or launching a new product. You have to think about all those things. And that has to be factored in. There's a cost to defending yourself against abuse. Yeah, yeah. It's not just opening seller support tickets the way most people try. Yeah, completely. And I think that's it. I think a lot of businesses think that Amazon is that, is almost like a easy gateway to selling. Um, but in actual fact, if you when you set up your own business, 
you don't go into your own business and start working with clients without contracts. There's always some mm. kind of element where you've got to cover yourself. And mm -hmm. I guess you've got to build that into the cost. And I think because it's kind of not like the, intellectual property, hiring exactly. an intellectual property attorney, registering your trademark, your patent, your design, protecting your copyright. How many brands are getting hit with copyright, fake copyright complaints mm -hmm. right now and losing listings for days or weeks because yeah. they haven't copyrighted their images? Tons of them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I guess that's the part that businesses are less want to invest less in it's less fluffy is it it's like it's the it's yeah. the less exciting part but it needs to be put in place so um yeah i've always said that and uh now yeah when we talk to clients we definitely uh mention that um mm -hmm. because it is something that is is really important and i guess you know when it comes to suspensions and everything a lot i we speak to businesses and if they come to us sort of saying help us we're, we're like well go to chris <laughs> fortunately we don't want to help you we've got somebody we can give you to yeah chris chris will sort yeah. this for you right. um is that some biz some companies out there are saying oh well i didn't know about this and all of a sudden our account mm. suspended how much of that is really true i mean are they just ignoring all complete warning signs or can it be that brutal it can depend on how new they are some new yeah. people just don't actively seek out articles and videos on that topic so i yeah. can see how there are some there will always be some newer people who haven't heard of this it's not as common now I mean, you and I are a little spoiled. We both were involved with the Prosper Show. We meet people in person who are well versed in this stuff. They're well versed in the industry and the community. You know, we've got the Seller Velocity Conference that we do. We meet with people in person. We give talks. So we're exposed to those people. And there are populations of sellers out there that we're not exposed to from conferences mm -hmm. or from comments on our podcast, right? And they're out there and we know they're out there, but we only, at least in my, you know, core services, we only hear from them after something terrible's happened. And for years, we've been scratching our heads, trying to figure out how do we get to that population earlier mm -hmm. and tell them like, we actually don't want to work with you only when you're in distress, when yeah. you've got terrible anxiety, even though we're not marketers or the growth, the revenue growth people, mm -hmm. we want to work with people who understand at least the threat. Yep instead of just, I've never heard of this threat. And sellers have less of an excuse now just because there's so much material out there. You do have to spend some time sifting through it. You have to vet the reliability of your sources. Um, you know, uh, there's no shame in saying that we're both ex Amazon and we know more than the average consultant mm -hmm. on a lot of the topics that, that fit into our core services. Not because you and I are complete geniuses, although you're obviously a very smart person, oh, but you. because <laughs> yeah, but because we have the experience and we were there for years. Yeah. And we had that exposure. And it's just like if it's every day what you're dealing with, you understand which bucket different situations fit into. And yeah. I think a lot of sellers view themselves a bit more charitably than Amazon would or a bit more charitably than, than I would, or my teams would mm -hmm. in terms of like violations, you know, yeah. there used to be the like, well, everyone's doing this. I know it's a violation, but everyone's doing it. Or how come I haven't been caught up till now? I've been doing this for months or years. And mm -hmm. they assume it'll continue along that way because it's worked up until today. That means it will work, you know, ad infinitum, which is not the way to think. Amazon can turn on a dime, you need to be agile and flexible and be able to turn on a dime. Amazon wasn't even requesting certain kinds of compliance documentation, right? Mm -hmm. For let's say consumable sellers, supplement sellers yep. until, until a year and a half ago, right? Mm -hmm. So you could have sold millions and millions in supplements for like four years and you could have assumed that yep. they were never going to ask for yep. ISO certified lab testing or whatever it was, even selling electronics and other things. Um, they wanted the testing, you know, they came under more scrutiny. There were more complaints. Yep. There's more, there's more governmental scrutiny of Amazon in the U S and in Europe. And uh, there's more media scrutiny. Yep. So things, things change. So that kind of adaptability is essential. And I believe that people should go in, even if they're new, yeah, they should go in knowing they might have to double their headcount. Yeah, and add some compliance people or add, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there are services out there that help you recover uh, 
financial compensation if your inventory is lost or stranded or damaged or you, you submit some removal orders and you get a bunch of inventory back that's smashed up. There are companies that exist, not, not our company, but there are companies out there that do that. Yep. And it's good to know these things instead of just wildly trying to learn on the fly. I mean, Amazon tends to ignore you if you try to learn on the fly. Yeah. And it's, it's the, it's protecting yourself. And you mentioned something in key there is, and this is a conversation we often, and have well x is doing it so why can't we do it and it's mm-hmm. like well x is going to get caught at some point and mm-hmm. it's not about because that someone else is doing it we can do it because you might be that unlucky seller that then is pulled up and you mm-hmm. can't then turn around to amazon and say oh yeah well we were only doing it because we saw that our competitor was doing it so we thought right. it was okay right and trying to have that and as you say you know, we also have this other conversation. Well, our content, we opt, we did our content a year ago and it was fine. So now it's being pulled up for this, um, you know, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's not a set it up and leave it strategy with Amazon right. because right. all of a sudden there might be some buzzword in your content that all of a sudden now Amazon systems don't like and it's the evolution with Amazon. It's interesting. And, and we get into the psychology of it, right? Whether we're mm. on podcasts or speaking privately, but you wouldn't say, you know, as a Wall Street firm trading, you wouldn't say, well, other people are insider trading. So <laughs> I, 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 I can get away with that too. No, you'd expect that everyone busted for insider training, trading, I'm sorry, gets, gets uh, penalties for that. Mm. For some reason that doesn't translate over the, in, in, the Amazon seller space where people say, well, everyone's abusing the, the product review process. They're manipulating reviews. So in order to compete, I need to do it too. They don't see that as being like the Wall Street insider trading mm-hmm. argument. They think those are two yeah. totally different things. And they're not. It's the same concept. The only different is, difference is with Wall Street, you're going to have a governmental agency chasing you around. And with Amazon, with the exception of the FTC, is chasing fake reviews up the site. But With Amazon, it's Amazon is the government, quote unquote, that's chasing you. Well, Amazon's incredibly inconsistent. And actually, a lot of the things that they see live on the site, like you're probably talking about people trying to optimize their listings with violation phrases or content, um, you know, badly written titles that violate the rules. Mm -hmm. Often, Amazon only reacts if it's reported. Mm -hmm. It's not proactive. It's reactive. Yep. So you could you could have free reign and do something every day for a year and get away with it. But on a year and a day, it gets reported and you lose it immediately. Well, you hadn't been reported for that year. Sellers are 10 times better at reporting each other's violations now than they were five years ago or three years ago. And yep. Amazon is actually better at responding to reports of abuse or violations now than they were before, because in the old days, they just told you to go through Seller Central report a listing violation. Mm-hmm. Where did those go? Those created tickets that disappeared into the ether. I mean, those were almost worthless. So things do change over time. And if, mm-hmm. I mean, actually sellers are better now at coming back again and again. They used to complain to us, well, we reported it once and nothing happened. So we forgot about it. That was very typical. I would say 60 or 75% of the time people would start the conversation with me saying that. People don't say that nearly as much now. I would say it's more like 30%. And the rest of the people say, I reported it via an email address that you mentioned on your podcast. I reported it through Seller Central. I read an article where they mentioned uh, that there was a guy that I looked up on LinkedIn and he was in charge of that team and I reported it to him. People tell me four or five, six places they report it. Wow. And, And guess what? One of those six things works. Yep. And it works faster. It's a totally different world now. So people can't expect to kind of slide by under the radar. This is my new, the new phrase I hate is when sellers talk about under the radar. Nothing's under the radar. Um, Unless your competition's asleep. I mean, I suppose people have competitors who are just not aware of this stuff. Maybe, Maybe they designate a brand registered agent. They don't even have their own seller account. Yep. And they're just sort of letting it all fly and they're asleep yep. and you're selling aside their comatose state. And that's what you're, you know, you're lucky if you're yeah. in that boat, then great. I mean, you don't have to do what everyone else does. Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of key points. And I think that it's good that people are saying, well, no, that's not fair. 
Um, and actually, it should be fair in that businesses are going out there and reporting because it is one of those where it shouldn't be that other people get away with it. You know, mm-hmm. um, it reminds me almost sort of being back at school. Why should X get away with it if yeah. we have to do do it that way? Right. But I think, you know, there's two parts here as well, though, isn't there? There's one part that you sort of mentioned in terms of this proactive part where you've just got to understand the policies. There's no excuse. You've got to read the small print. You've got to understand all the requirements and what you need to do. Now, there's an element of interpretation, but at the same time, you need to read it all. But then there's this abuse part, right, that Mm -hmm. is kind of like an interesting part that seems to have evolved. There's, There's businesses out there that are just understanding how to almost um cheat the system black hats yeah black hats and and so i guess that's the part that you can't be proactive for right that's the part that you've as you say you've got to be ready um for if that happens so what would you say you know what should brands be doing to prepare let's say if they are sort of attacked in it in more from that abuse angle yeah keeping an eye on your listings i mean for some things you can prevent the black hats. If you're yeah. using flat files and you're syncing up to Amazon's API and you're reloading flat file content and you're making sure there are no vacant fields, then you're not going to experience backend keyword abuse mm-hmm. as much. Uh, I mean, there are some things you can do to prevent, obviously locking down your intellectual property. Like I said earlier, yeah. uh, lots of people haven't copyrighted their images. Uh, we've had some clients where their black hat competitors created a whole website or even a Facebook page using those images and then reports them saying mm-hmm. you've copyrighted us, even if their images were copies of yours. Well, one way to appeal that is to show that you've copyrighted your images and yep. when, and have that documentation. I can't tell you how many brands haven't done that. I mean, that's something that is preventable, but I like what you said about even just reading. It's not so much interpretation of the policies. It, it, it's that too, but it's reading the policies and everybody loves examples. A good example of that is the multiple account policy. Um, A lot of people in our world come to us and ask us, well, we're thinking of creating a second account. We want to be within the guidelines. I mean, good intentions right there. They ask me some questions. They tell me some details. And I ask them either by, I can tell by their messaging that they haven't read the policy, or Mm -hmm. I ask them flat out, did you, have you compared what you're telling me against the policy? Well, we haven't read the policy yet. Um, I send them a link to the policy page, but I think there's, I don't want to call it a laziness. There's there's a a sense of, I can just ask this on the forums and they'll Mm -hmm. tell me. Um, I can just ask one of these experts and they'll tell me. So they haven't even read, I mean, this could be, if they do it wrong, they could, first of all, break the the policy and face um, discipline for that. Yeah. Or they could create a second seller account and not even understand that if that gets suspended, their first account, their primary account could be impacted negatively. Um, So they could lose everything potentially, and they don't even know where to find the policy. Um, It's in Seller Central. I'm not saying it's a beautifully written policy, by the way. I'm not saying it's all inclusive. Um, There are some policy pages I've seen amended over the years. Some of them haven't been amended and they have the same language back when I was working there, which is scary. Some of them have have been amended to the point where they've got paradoxical content in there. So I'm not saying it's a beautifully written policy, but the fact that they haven't even sought it out, that their first instinct was to Google Amazon consultant and ask that person, which could be Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe not me, but it could be somebody who's doing it as a side hustle who doesn't even know the answer to the question. That's what I find scary in this business because they'll tell me things right, right off the bat that show that they don't understand the risk that they're taking. So exactly. And sometimes I often think, is it because I'm, I often have people say, Oh, well, you talk Amazonian, right? Like it's this (laughs) language. Um, And it's like we discovered that it's like the matrix of one understanding the language. But then I do read. I mean, I read through Amazon policies and I think, is it that we speak the language or is it just you, you know, because is it complex? I don't think it is so complex. As you say, it's you've got to invest the time in reading through that. And it's like you see that so much with contracts in general There's Mm -hmm. a 10 page contract. 
um, you go to sign it. I'm one of those annoying people that people go sign there. And I'm like, well, five minutes, I'm not going to read it. I'll, I'll read through mm. everything. I want to know right. what I'm signing. Of course. But you do see so many people, you know, even we send out contracts to new clients who sign it so quick. You think, mm, I don't think you've actually <laughs> signed, you've read it. Um, yeah. And it is vital because you need to know what you're getting yourself in for, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I've had that too. People sign our contracts quickly. Of course, if their whole account is down, you can understand why there's some haste. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think that policies are necessarily written in Amazon's legalese, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, but I have kind of an excuse in answering this because I believe that you have to help Amazon teams internally communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for that, you need the jargon. And for that, you need their mm -hmm. language, not necessarily yes. reading what's in Seller Central. Yeah. But, and this is something maybe I can spend this year devoting a bit more communication publicly about it. A lot of your communication to Amazon is helping their siloed, you know, disconnected teams interact with each other on your behalf. Yeah. Which sounds crazy. Why should I help Amazon communicate between teams? Um, and that's their infrastructure and that's their job to manage their teams. Okay, great. In theory, in practice, yeah. Amazon has globally, I think the last number is 1.6 million employees globally. Mm -hmm. We all know that they've got problems communicating with each other. Forget about communicating yeah. with you. Everyone knows that their messaging is poorly written, it's generic, it doesn't say anything, at least in the seller performance space. Mm -hmm. So that goes that or seller support cases, let's yep. say. Everyone should know that. Um, the fact that they can't even communicate with each other is both alarming and distressing, but it means that when you communicate to them, you have to start giving them info that they'll share with each other, mm -hmm. planting a seed even. So we've started writing appeals where we say, we talked to this team, we told them blank, they clearly don't understand blank. We need you to tell them because they're not doing it. We've tried them, it's not yep. gonna happen. We reached the point where forget it, we gave up. So we're giving up on them. We need you to tell them what we're now telling you. I know that sounds absurd, mm -hmm. but the good news is we know a lot of the internal jargon so yep. we can say, um, instead of saying account compromise, we can say VCAC, which is an yeah. acronym. Long story short, you know, it means you, you're, you've lost access to your account. You've been compromised. So we st that's the best example I have. We started having sellers put that in the subject line of emails. We're a VCAC. Now, there are some teams in Amazon that, doesn't, that don't know what that is, but the teams that matter know what it is. Mm. Yeah. So if they forward that message, well, this isn't us, we got to transfer it over. The person who receives it will immediately understand. Now, what's the alternative? Compare that to we've been hacked. Yeah. We can't sign in. Yeah. This, you know, all this other generic, you, maybe you can't sign in because Amazon deliberately signed you out. That's one reason. Yeah. That's very different. Hacked can mean about seven different things yeah. in e-commerce parlance. I mean, Hacking something actually means something totally different. These words get, you know, our account's been hijacked. You know what? Hijacked in the Amazon space can mean about eight different things. Yeah. yeah. And those terms get misused. The hijack term especially gets misused. Yeah. You can't sign in. We've lost access. We've been hacked. People start sending that to seller support. They get terrible advice back. Yeah. They send it to teams that aren't seller performance, that don't do VCACs at Amazon, and they... I don't know. You lost your, maybe check your password, right? Yeah. All this advice that has like nothing to do with it because they don't know how to advise you because yeah. you're not speaking their language. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's such a good point. And we even find that just sort of from the side that we uh, work in, which is more the catalog, like working with vendor central, vendor support, mm -hmm. seller support on that, is that there's certain words that are very, Amazon is Amazon jargon where mm -hmm. and as soon as you mention those words it's like an internal thing right okay you get that result quicker um which is something not uh, as you say right. not everybody is going going to understand and and with that with um when something does happen and goes unfortunately horribly wrong for sellers and you've probably seen so many different scenarios day in mm -hmm. day out um 
Is there, are you ever surprised? Have you, or is it kind of like, oh, this is typical? Or can there sometimes be something like, wow, this is a, this is a new one for, for even me who lives and breathes this kind of um, suspensions and deactivations? I mean, probably the unsubstantiated health claims, a lot of mm. products were, you know, I think people assumed that they could put certain phrases in there, you know, they, they believed as long as it didn't say something like cures anxiety or cures cancer, they thought in terms of extremes, as long as we don't make some blatant, ridiculous health claim that you could never substantiate, we're okay putting in some of these keywords. And they hired some like, you know, agencies to help them with keyword placement and things like that. And they were making, you know, just to optimize their listings, they were making claims they couldn't, that, that violated policy. They were claims that had to be deleted. And they'd come to us and say, we're being attacked. Or uh, somebody bought from us and, and said that uh, our product wasn't safe. And then we look at it and we look at their listing and we say, no, you're making, this has been flagged for a policy reason. Yeah. You know? Well, we're just making this statement. Okay, that's a health claim. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not really making a health claim. Okay, by their terms, it is, you mm. know. Um, so there's a knee-jerk reaction to say Amazon's bots are, are chasing us. Yeah. And I know that happens sometimes. Like the pesticide one is the best example. Oh, yeah. We don't sell <laughs> pesticides. Okay, do you have terms that might have attracted the pesticide-related bots in Amazon? No, we don't. Well, I don't think so. Well, maybe we do. We have those conversations that gradually, yeah. slowly gravitate in that direction. Um, assuming it's a glitch. Um, people love, a, Amazon puts a line at the end of these suspensions. Like if you think that you've been suspended in error, do this. Everyone goes straight down to that. Yes, it's an error. What they mean is it's an error on their side, like a complete mistake. They'll look at it again and they'll, and they'll, they'll know within a second, yeah, this is a mistake and they'll fix it. Yeah. They don't mean, do you think you feel like you can argue that an error has been made and you, you, you've you been treated unfairly or they misread something? Because I can't tell you how many people we hear from who say this is an error and they don't appeal it on the basis of Amazon made an obvious mistake. Mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to interpret it like they've been treated unfairly somehow. This is an error because we see lots of people doing it and you're punishing us and not them. Really? That means you've been suspended in error. It's just yeah. the mentality. You got to think in terms of um, eliminating those knee jerk reactions mm -hmm. to say, I didn't do anything. You did something, you know? Yeah. The problem in this relationship isn't me. It's all you. Like how many yeah. times has that been true in life? <laughs> exactly. And it, it's taking that victim yeah. approach and which is yeah. just definitely that there's got to be often a potential reason why it's happened in the in the first instance. So so with that in mind, because you say the knee jerk reaction and I think mm. there is uh, people go into panic mode straight away. Um, so if this does happen, somebody's got one of their key sellers that's just been deactivated or mm -hmm. account suspended, what would you say are the first steps that a seller should do when they get that and not kind of just, as you say, click on it's not my fault or just kind of look, completely lose all composure? <laughs> yeah, don't. I mean, first look at your own, how clean is your ship? Mm -hmm. How tightly run is your ship? Yeah. Don't assume it's an, it's an attack. You know, we're yeah. being attacked and then there's no evidence of it. Yeah. A competitor is attacking us or Amazon did something they shouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. We haven't done anything that we weren't supposed to do because we've been doing this for a while and nobody ever told us differently. Or yeah. you could say as a fourth, don't say, I called seller support and asked them if I could do something. And they said, yeah, sure, go ahead. Because nobody cares about that on the yeah. policy teams. Everyone knows inside, by the way, inside and outside the company, everyone knows that seller support advice is often wrong, often off base or just answering a question with the wrong info type stuff. Um, you can't use, you can't quote Amazon back to them by taking what you found in a seller support case. Yeah. Um, so you have to look, take a hard look at yourself first, see if it's actually something you've done that you need to fix don't point fingers. But secondly, can you prove, can you document that it's an Amazon mistake or that it is a competitor attack? Yeah. Because I can't tell you how quickly you'll be denied if you say, well, 
we've been attacked by competitors before, and this looks like another one, and we can't prove it, but you're Amazon, you've got all the data, you got all the info there at your fingertips. So you guys sort it out and you, you clean it up. That'll be a rejection, unless you've got documentation that proves some of this. And it doesn't have to be a letter from a company necessarily. It can be, hey, we were hit with a fake copyright complaint. We submitted a DMCA counter notice. You gave the other party 10 days to respond. They didn't defend themselves on their copyrights at all. They let the 10 days lapse so they, they could get 10 days of sales on us. We went right back to selling and got reinstated and they came right back on the 11th day with another copyright complaint. Mm. Suspicious timing. We've already defended this DMCA counter. Like that's real. You can use yeah. that to defend yourself. Not, we sent an email to this party about their copyrights. They didn't respond. So this is definitely a an attack. And oh, by the way, we haven't copy copyrighted our images. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I mean, go in from a position of strength. Yeah. And don't even submit, this is terrible to say to people sometimes when they're in a state of panic or anxiety, mm -hmm. but don't even submit an appeal at all if you can't back up most of what you're saying in that document, mm -hmm. in that appeal, with documentation, with proof, with evidence, with data points, with something right? Not just people responding to policy violations. You warned us for policy. Well, look at our metrics, okay? That has nothing to do with the policy violation. Mm -hmm. How could we have such brilliant metrics if we've been violating your policies like this for three months? And then they come to me and I say, well, did you ever get a warning for violating this policy? Yeah, but we assumed it was a mistake because we saw in the forums that a lot of people got this warning and nobody got suspended and nothing came of it. Mm -hmm. Lots of ignored policy violations. Like, or they just, they're in paralysis. Yeah, They're not yep. sure if they violated it. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. We don't know how to figure that out. We don't know what to do. The days pass, nobody makes a decision. Pretty soon they forget about it. Yeah. Amazon's got a long memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So. And I think that's it. I think there is this panic. It's a very, it's a, it's a bit of an emotional subject, isn't it? And, you know, um, you do see that reactive state, which, is definitely can actually bring more harm than good if you just jump mm -hmm. in and start responding without even understanding what Amazon is saying. So to um, to sign off, because this has been awesome, and I, I'm sure those that have been listening have really been able to uh, take some tips away, particularly around the making sure you're reading everything and you fully understand <laughs> the policies, yeah. but from a protection standpoint as well, in terms of, you know, you've mentioned about the copyright aspect um, of your images and your trademark and everything. There's lots of things that you can do to minimize that risk. So if you had were to give anyone that was um, uh, a top tip to those, to our listeners, basically that um, I always say a top tip to someone that receives a warning, what would mm -hmm. your top tip be? Lately, it's been decide at a very early stage if you're going to handle something, at least if it's seller performance related, handle it yourself or mm -hmm. bring somebody like me in to at least advise and consult, even if you're not hiring that, pe that person entirely to take over. Decide at a very early stage where your limit is, understanding that you could be digging a deeper and deeper hole the more appeal attempts you make because there's nothing worse these days than hearing from somebody who's appealed something a dozen times or even half a dozen times and they've gotten themselves super stuck and that's when they reach out for help mm -hmm. because you could be beyond help. Yeah. Um, we don't take every case, we don't fix every problem, at mm -hmm. least at, at our company. But I mean, most of the time we can contribute, you know, a solution there that, that may have been there before, but you didn't know it was there before because you waited so long. So it's not so much don't wait, call today. You know, it sounds like a, you know, <laughs> free phone number out or a billboard somewhere. Um, but decide if you're going to stay the course yourself from the, decide that from the outset if you can. Otherwise decide it after you make a single attempt. Because if you think, well, there's a wide network and variety of agents and agencies and consultants out there that can bail me out if this goes sideways, but I'm gonna to try to learn this on my own. You know, the time to learn it on your own was before you had the problem, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. to prevent it. 
Yeah. And maybe, maybe you didn't see the payoff quote unquote by actually getting into trouble, but it's good that you avoided it. Yeah. And it's good that you never saw that result. Um, but when you go four five, six times into something and you're just moving a few words around, or you're calling in and talking to account health reps and you're taking their word as gold and you're just doing everything they say, and then you still get disappointing results. You've already sort of built a strategy where you're on the fence, leaning out, Mm -hmm. or you're, you're less than 50, 50 on resolution success. And it's like, that's fine. I mean, I'm not telling people how to run their businesses, yeah. but just, but just tell, don't complain later. <laughs> Com completely. And, and that's really, yeah. really useful advice. And I always say to my team, look guys, we, we, we know how to grow accounts and sales and we can do the ads, the marketing and everything. But if mm -hmm. there's something that happens with an account that requires some element of appeal, don't jump in. That's when we need to sit down and evaluate where we move forward. Or is it something that we call on Chris for? Um, because that is it, you know, because that's you've got to be aware of what your strengths are and what you're good at. And just because you're able to sell on Amazon doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get yourself out um, and mm -hmm. be able to write, write an appeal. So thank you, Chris, for being such an awesome guest today and for sharing your top tips with our listeners. And for those that are listening, if you do find yourself in a difficult situation with Amazon, maybe a suspended account or a deactivated product, please reach out to Chris and you can find Chris at ecommercechris.com. And you'll find the link in the description of the podcast. And if you need any support managing your Amazon business, e-commerce nurse is there to support you in building your Amazon strategy and managing your seller or vendor account on your behalf. So thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Talk to you again.